Okay, let's do it. Our first guest has been a film critic for nearly 25 years. He began as part of the generation of young movie critics who cut their teeth at the Boston Phoenix during the 1980s with critics like Stephen Sheff, Owen Gleiberman, and Charles Taylor. He would move on to The Village Voice and New York Post until 1996, where he came into his own as film critic for the online magazine Slate. For nine years, he has been one of the leading critical voices of the Internet age. He is now lead film critic for New York Magazine, where his blog, The Projectionist, can also be found. He is the movie critic for NPR's Fresh Air with Terry Gross and can be seen on CBS Sunday Morning. Please welcome a man that means a great deal to all of us, Mr. David Edelstein. Mr. Edelstein, are you with us? I am. It's a great, it's a great honor, and thank you for uh, for checking out all those credits. I uh, <laughs> I'd forgotten about the New York Post myself. We're well, honored to have you. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm going to turn the turn the uh, the table here to Aaron, and we'll start start our dirty hairy conversation. Okay. Hey, David. How you doing? Hi, Aaron. Great to uh, talk to you. Were you even alive in 1983? Speaking I, of which, I was. Uh, I was five. I was. That, I you was were five? Be five. Wow. I was going to be five years old. Great. That, I was some, 13. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure uh, we won't get into it, but I, I almost swear, swear I could have heard your eyes rolling when we announced our Sidney Lumet tribute. But uh, no, no, no. That would that would be Armand White. I think oh, you're okay. talking about. <laughs> okay. I was I was wondering why you don't have Armand in because you know Armand is pretty fearless. I mean, if Sidney Lumet were there himself, you know, eighty whatever years old, Armand would go like, "So why do you make such crappy movies anyway?" You know what we but we, we had like we had David. We had Armand on for the Brian De Palma tribute show, so ah, okay. we, 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 we've already been there, done that. Okay, but he loves he loves De Palma. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, that was safe. That was a safe bet. That, yeah, for the most part. <laughs> for the most part. <laughs> That's right. I'm sure part of our – I love – by the way, I love Armand. There's, he has no bigger fan, but Armand – the trick to understanding Armand is that you have to understand that for every every review, he's either got to talk about how the um, – the clueless, you know, critics missed this genius, or the clueless critics, um, you know, didn't recognize this genius. It can never just yes. just be the thing itself. So anyway, none of us understand Brian De Palma like he does. Uh, like, excuse me, David. That means I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry. I, I missed a lot. I mean, I just really, <laughs> I missed the subtext. I missed the whole like the homage to um, Billy Wilder. Okay, but it's beside the point. Okay, yeah. but uh, well. But here, let's let's get to, let's get to Clint Eastwood. Yes, okay, let's get to Dirty Harry, uh, Clint Eastwood, but Dirty Harry in particular. And like uh, like Jamie said, there's this massive box set that is coming out because uh, just I guess it was finally time, both regular DVD and Blu-ray, and it's kind of the the final stop on Dirty Harry and home entertainment. And it's it's a pretty remarkable box. I've been going through it for the last two three days, and there's just documentaries on the violence of the film, the politics of the film, uh, and then commentary. Of course, Schickel, uh, Richard Schickel does two commentaries. One on, what a surprise. Yeah, on yeah. <laughs> Dirty Harry and Sudden Impact. Uh, and then other, uh, John Milius does a very lively commentary in Magnum 4. So we'll, we'll try we to cover all this. for that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I got to, so let's, let's start with the first Dirty Harry film. So they, mm. uh, when did you first see Dirty Harry? The, the oh original? man! What was, uh, what was your original, what were your immediate reactions? To my immediate film? reaction? Oh my, well, okay. I was born in 1959, and mm-hmm. Dirty Harry, I believe, came out the summer of '71, mm-hmm. and I saw it. Now, if I were my dad and mom at the time, I would never in a million years bring you know, bring. Oh no, it might have been '72. Sorry, it was 72, and I was already a veteran of the French Connection. So I'd seen all the splatter, and I'd heard all the swearing. And so we went to – but now that I think about it, my brother, who's three and a half years younger, he was there too. Mm-hmm. And I, I certainly don't condone that. Um, as, as a complete aside, my daughter went to a sleepover party last night. She's 10, and they, they watched Juno. And I practically marched over there and strangled the mom because that is – I don't care if it's PG-13. I, if I were going to show, if she were going to see Juno, it was going to be with me. Anyway, I saw it. It, I mean, um, I'm not going to say literally blew me away because it didn't literally blew me away, but it, it metaphorically blew me away. I think um, if you if you were around at that time, um, there was, 
you you have to understand, it, and you should, by the way, read uh, Jay Hoberman's great, great book, um, the name of which escapes me. It's so great. Um, uh, in which Clint Eastwood is on the cover with the with his uh, with his big magnum. I, I'm looking back at my shelf here, uh, where it is somewhere. He it's it's a book about the uh, oh here it is the dream life. Yeah, uh, the, movies, yeah. media, and the mythology of the '60s. Well, <clears throat> you have to understand that we're we're coming off uh, a um, a period in which uh, uh, easy there, there's easy rider there's there's the counterculture is in full bloom by the time of 1971. But Nixon is in office, and Nixon has this law and order platform. And um, yeah, there had been Gimme Shelter, and everything had gone bad at Altamont. And we're st- and, and oh, don't forget the Zodiac. Now, now this generation is up to date on what was happening in San Francisco. So all of this stuff came together in the air, the Nixon Law and Order platform, the rage against the hippies, the presence of the Zodiac. So they just decided that they were going to – and the Miranda Laws were relatively new. They came about in uh, – I'm not a legal scholar, but I think it was 65 or 66. Mm-hmm. So there was this idea that liberal judges were coddling criminals. The hippies were showing a slightly more malevolent side. Um, Dirty Harry came – and it was absolutely shocking, stunning. I mean, even those of us who liked hippies, who were sympathetic to the movement, just there was something about that, that white male with his big, mag, his big long magnum saying, you know, my favorite line in the movie is when, is when he's in this tunnel and this kid comes up and tries to mug him. And he says, oh, go away. Get get the hell out of here! And the kid was like, "Come on, give me your give me your wallet." And then he pulls out this giant gun and says, "You don't listen, do you, asshole?" And that's my favorite line. I think <laughs> right. Melius wrote that line. That's yes, a, forget did. forget the uh, the you know six shots or five. That's one of the great lines in the movie. <laughs> you don't listen, do you, asshole? And of course, only only Eastwood could say it. Um, it was it was a devastating movie to see then. I mean. Every part, I mean, the first half of it is much more brilliant than the second half because the politics really come in in the second half and it gets very convoluted and very, uh, I think, pretty far-fetched that this guy would be allowed to go free and nobody would notice him on the street but Harry Callahan. You know, I mean, don't forget, the Berkeley professor comes in and says, you don't have a case, you didn't read him as Miranda writes, you didn't have a, you didn't have a, uh, a search warrant. So you went in there and you stomped all over him. And then he's let free, and it all happens in a vacuum. Now, that's an incredibly distorted way to present that. But it didn't matter, because when you were sitting there watching, you wanted this guy to die. You wanted him to die in the world. You wanted him to die like you never wanted anybody to die in your whole life. And when he got it at the end, I don't remember how many times Harry shoots him, but, but you know, it felt like he emptied his clip, even though he probably only shot him once. Right. It was the most amazing moment. The entire theater went crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the, 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 that was a very long answer to the fact that I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I saw it. My dad let took me back. It was rated R. It didn't matter. I saw it three or four times in the theater. I memorized it. I loved it. I loved it. I was, I was of course, rather oblivious to the politics of it. Right. It is funny you bring up, you say that the, the first half is better than the, the second half, because the film really has its kind of, I guess you could say, climax, if you will, when Harry steps on the wounded on the wounded leg. The gun, That's the, correct. That is the real catharsis of the film. And then you, you do get this, this now infamous Berkeley scene, which is, I just reread uh, Pauline Kael's review, so let, we'll bring this in real quick. What a coincidence, me yeah. too. And uh, she... She really dissects this scene because obviously she was from San Francisco. Well, let's go, let's let's step back for just a second there and say that what you saw, if you were um, watching the movie, as far as everybody in the audience was concerned, the movie should have ended there. Right. You know, it was it was very fast. You know, it had all the ingredients of a great um, detective thriller. He gets there, he finds the guy, he captures the guy. All that was missing was him killing the guy. Right. Okay, but. You know, the story is essentially over, should be over at that point. And who is going to get in the way of that story being over? Well, who else? A Berkeley professor. Right. 
because uh, Kale shrewdly points out that in a real life situation, they would have gotten a lawyer from uh, Hastings College, and I think she says another nearby college, but they use Berkeley as kind of a. Uh, well, it's hard to think that the DA would turn to a Berkeley professor right, for advice. Is... I mean, even back then, hmm. you would. But you see, let me, let me just backpedal. I know this is endless digression, but right. if you if you if you watch um, Birth of a Nation, if you go back that far in film hmm. history. You understand that the, the whole vigilante tradition comes out of this idea that the law is essentially throwing up its hands. The, the official law, you know, uh, force of law and order is just throwing up its hands and saying, you know, we cannot protect you. And this, this is about we cannot protect you. This is about, it's about Miranda. It's about the perception that judges were coddling criminals mm -hmm. and were worried more about the criminal than the victim. Obviously, we see, the, we see a, a resurgence of that. You know, that's going pretty strong today with Nancy Grace and Bill O'Reilly and, and all the, the, the kind of lynch mob mentality of, of Fox News and a lot of, right. the, uh, a lot of CNN. But this at the time, this was pre-death wish, you know. This was this was pretty unusual. Mm -hmm. Well, and, well, here, here a couple of questions that this brings up. One is that because you brought up the French Connection, and I think the other film that is key in these kind of, I guess you could say, this type of mood that was going on in the country came out at the end of nineteen seven, in the summer of seventy, is a uh, Joe, Peter Boyle, the uh, hard hat film. Mm -hmm. Another yeah. film that kind of has some of the same. Anger. Yeah, but do you remember? I mean, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but do you remember how Joe ended? Right, Joe. Well, see, Joe is interesting in that it has the rage of these other two films, but it still has that residue of the counterculture. And, and the French uh, Connection, too. Right. The, both the French Connection and Joe end, ended with somebody killing the wrong person. Right. Okay, so even though the, the, the main, the protagonists of both films, or uh, in Joe, he wasn't precisely the protagonist, but the most powerful figures in both films were uh, loudmouth, vaguely fascist, you know, cops who, mm -hmm. who or not cops, or, or uh, law and order types, right. who, who felt that it was... Well, blue-collar types, blue-collar blue collar, types. Blue-collar types who felt that it, lethal force was permissible, mm -hmm. given, the, the, given the permissive environment that they had to stand up and use lethal force because nobody else would to rid society of the scum. By the way, even as I say that, I think how brilliant Taxi Driver was for coming along five, uh, four years later and essentially turning Death Wish on its head and you know showing the sort of dark, twisted, psychotic underbelly of mm -hmm. that kind of thinking. But yeah, that, but Joe... Say what you will about Joe and the French Connection, both of which are problematic movies, although I think incredibly powerful movies. Um, there was still a great deal of lingering ambivalence on the part of the filmmakers. Um, Joe ends with, you know, the last person in the world you'd want to be killed right. by, uh, you know, a person, a person doing it. The French Connection ends with Popeye Doyle shooting what he thinks is Frog One, and it's not Frog One; it's another cop. And then and, we get those final shots off camera, so we right. don't even know what we don't even know what happens if he does get the right person. Well, we know he doesn't because Frog One right. comes back in French Connection too. Right. I think it. I think it. I think we, the final shot it, that we hear in the French Connection is the ultimate expression of impotence. Right. You know, of the cop and and that you know that music that horribly unresolved, unsettled, whining music. I mean, it's it's a. Um, I mean, a lot of people came out of the French Connection very happy because a lot of people had been splattered all over the walls, but not Frog One. So Dirty Harry was a step forward insofar as it gave you the full catharsis, and then some, you know? What's interesting about the, comparing French Connection and Dirty Harry is that in French Connection, uh, Popeye's racism is out in the open. He uses the N-word. Uh, he uses all the, 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 the ethnic slurs. And at the time, Roy Scheider, you know, the late Roy Scheider used to say, you know, he would go to the theaters and the black audiences or the, the Puerto Rican audiences would laugh and cheer when Popeye Doyle would use these epithets because they knew that's what Popeye and cops like him were that's thinking. What cops, so it was the were, world that they knew. Yeah. It, was a different, it was a different climate because 
because uh, it was, I mean, nobody had yet sort of risen up and said, hey, you can't say that. Right, um, right. right. It, it, simply seeing the world they knew was was a kind of victory for them, even if the character was, you know, was their enemy. Which is interesting to compare to Dirty Harry, because over the, over the years of the Dirty Harry film, Harry's racial bigotry, if uh, maybe that's too strong a word, but racial <coughs> discomfort is plainly obvious, but he doesn't really use epithets or anything derogatory. It's well, just more in his action. Harry became Archie Bunkerized. Right. Excuse me, Aaron. That's because yeah. he. The great line is he, the guy says, you know, he doesn't. He hates everyone. Right. He's right. an equal opportunist. He doesn't. Yeah. That was the whole thing. He. Right. And the only if he does, if there is a prejudice he has, it was college boys. Right. He hated college boys. That was his only prejudice. But everyone, he was an equal opportunist, and that that was brought up um, decades later in Sidney Lumet's Q and A, the Nick Nolte character. He hates everyone. Right. Right. But I think I, I think he was uh, Archie Bunkerized. I mean, I think there was a way in which he was uh, his bigotry. See, the the point is, if 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 he's a bigot and it doesn't have any if it doesn't have any meaning, it doesn't translate into him, for example, beating up black people in lieu of white people or bringing a special animosity to hunting down Puerto Ricans or something like that. Then it doesn't. Then it doesn't matter if he's if he's a bigot. The law the law and order audience can stand that as long as he shoots the right person. Right. Right. And well, what's uh, interesting is that so and another film that's also around this time that that deals with this, and it's a British film, but it also has the same hard boldness, is the original Get Carter by mm-hmm. Mike Hodges, right. which also came out around uh, Christmas fall of seventy one. So it really seemed to be almost no one was. Uh, was able to bring it all together, but it seemed that this unease was really just a natural extinction of of the times. But I'm curious. Well, it was a natural. It was it was a backlash against against the 60s. You have to understand yeah. culture. It, it's such a pendular thing. The 70s, yeah. on one hand, represented this period of where every all the freedoms that were won in the 60s sort of came came to fruition. You know, drug use. Um, right. Sexual freedoms, uh, feminism really came into its own in the 70s, but alongside it came this powerful backlash, which eventually would manifest itself in, in the so-called Reagan Revolution, or at least get its support, draw its support from the backlash. But we w- we were seeing just the very very beginnings of that, of of, of that kind of thing, and the vigil the explosion. Look, there are other vigilante movies, but not very many of them. There was, I mean, there was that. Um, What's wrong with me? The the Glenn Ford uh, Fritz Lang movie. Um, oh, uh, the Big Heat. The Big Heat. The Big Heat. Okay. Yeah. I mean, The Big Heat is a pretty much straight up vigilante movie insofar as you know his wife is murdered and he takes the law into his own hands and it's it's you know, but those those kinds of movies were relatively rare back then. Usually, the protagonists work, worked within the law. Mm-hmm. You know, even if they 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 had to fight the law, if even if there was resistance, they weren't they didn't go outside the law. They didn't they didn't you know disobey their commanding officers to the extent that Harry would ultimately do. And I think Jim Hoberman, you know, was very brilliant in perceiving um, one of the strengths of Dirty Harry is that it fused this kind of outlaw mythology with a right wing reactionary mythology. Mm-hmm. Harry Harry became the maverick, the the outlaw maverick, you know, who mm-hmm. he was hip. Harry was Harry was he was a a very glamorous figure. He was very hip and and he was far more hip than the than the hippie that mm-hmm. he was uh, that he was going after. He was so much more hip. He was so much more masculine. You notice how how Andy Robinson gave this that guy a sort of feminine laugh. Yes, he, well, did. he, he my, wore a he wore a peace symbol on his belt, and he had this belt feminine laugh. Obvious, obvious symbol right yeah. there. And, and, and but the feminine laugh, I think, was far more significant than the peace. You're, than the you're right, symbol. David. And then also the 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 great uh, you know the the real wink wink line. He goes, "My, what a big gun uh, you have!" At one point, when right, he's, right, he's beat, <laughs> beating them up. And it it well, the, the interesting thing about and Kale pointed this out, and it is very true at this this, this stage in Eastwood's career. He was all masculinity. There was no sexual component in any of the Dirty Harry films up until 
the last one, he, when he's given a female partner in a third one, it's Tyne Daly, who is made up to be very unglamorous and very... Well, there was no, that there was was no very sexual... significant development. Yeah, yeah but he, there was no sexual vibe there between them whatsoever. I mean, no. she could have been a dyke for all, you know, yeah. for all anybody. And, and then, then you get into Sudden Impact, which you talk about Reagan Revolution. Sudden Impact is a very interesting film in that it's a film that was greenlit because of a survey, and it was in 83, Christmas of 83... So it's at the peak, uh, we're really getting into this Reagan groove, and right. it seemed to strip away any serious pretense of earlier Dirty Harry films and just took it to its barest essence to where mm-hmm. it even gave him a female doppelganger, if you will. With well, the dirt, dirt, Sudden Impact was a cartoon. I mean, we were, mm-hmm. we're looking at, when we're talking, when we jump from Sudden Impact to Dirty Harry, uh, I mean, from Dirty Harry to Sudden Impact, that is a huge leap stylistically. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, it's not just that Eastwood directed it, took over from Don Siegel, and Eastwood was nowhere near the director that he is now at the time, but mm-hmm. Sudden Impact was very much conceived as a cartoon and functioned, uh, you know, on, on I think, an even cruder level than Dirty well, Harry. Well, what's interesting, the, the way I looked at uh, Sudden Impact is that the warnings that per- particularly Kale gave about Dirty Harry and French Connection, the jolts for jocks line that she, that she coined in her French Connection review, is that Sudden Impact is really that film that she was warning us about, more so than Dirty Harry. Dirty Sudden Impact is really the film that's just all sensation and just the slimmest pretense of a... Of a well, of course, by then, by then movies had, had yeah. become that. I mean, right. uh, when she was writing uh, that review of The French Connection, I mean, that was a very... Uh, prescient review that she wrote in seventy in seventy one one of one of her one of her greatest I think um, in which she said that uh, she she feared that movies would devolve into jolts for jocks and it was really it didn't happen in the next few years but it did happen in the eighties it did yeah. happen in the eighties and and certainly I think it's the case now no. I mean it's hard to believe that anybody could. I mean, it's sort of like hearing uh, Eisenhower complain about, you know, warn us about the military-industrial complex. Was there ever a time when the military-industrial complex wasn't, you know, making all our foreign policy decisions? I mean, maybe maybe that was true. You think, was there ever a time movies weren't jolts for jocks? Well, yes, I guess. Once upon a time, that idea was, was truly horrific, you know? Excuse me, David. Yeah. Well, I have a question. Did, what, didn't you think by the time that Eastwood did take over the directing reins of Sudden Impact, and especially with the Deadpool, I don't, I don't remember that one that well, but don't you think you already knew that it had, it had become a cartoon? Well, Buddy Van Horn did the Deadpool. Yeah, um, but don't which, you think, though, by the time yeah. of Sudden Impact, it, it, he, even, even he knew it was a cartoon? Yeah, he did, and and he he did, and he, I think he brought that to, I mean, he deliberately over he, he overheated everything. He didn't. He really, he barely brought a trace of realism to that. Yeah. To that. Even, even they knew in the script reading that the line, make my day, was going to become the catchphrase. They knew that from the moment they saw the script. Well, make my, be... day, make my Day wasn't really original to that movie. No. Um, I mean, I, actually, I'm not sure about this, but I distinct, distinctly remember seeing a real sicko little movie called Vice Squad, Oh, um, wonderful. Back oh, in the yeah, day with, Vice uh, Squad, yeah. And as Wings I recall, Houser. remember Wings Hauser? Right. Yeah. I've been, look, by the way, I, if anybody there knows where I can get um, uh, the song that he sings over the closing credits called The Neon Slime, mm-hmm. I am desperate to <laughs> the Wings Hauser. But I distinctly remember the, the bad cop, I can't remember the name of the actor, you know. No, I telling, remember Vice Squad. I telling him to, you know, go ahead, you know, come on, come on, come on, you know, take it, take it, come on, come on, make my day, make me kill you, make my day. But, I mean, I, I don't, so I, I don't think that was even the first time, but, but what Eastwood did was he slowed it down. He would go ahead, make my day, you right. know. And, and it was repeated a number of times, and it became a... And the president used it. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was on the same level as Rambo. I mean, the president invoked it in the same way that he invoked Rambo at a certain point. You know, it really was sort of cartoon, mm-hmm. meathead, macho, m- macho intimidation. Mm-hmm. I mean, what, I, I what, yeah. What, what is interesting to note about Sudden Impact coming out at the end of '83, and that is the cartoon that Eastwood felt obliged to do, is that he countered that with something a little more thoughtful in the summer of '84. With Tightrope, which is a much of, better film, a much better film, 
well, at least a very a more interesting, thoughtful film where it's kind of the counterbalance, because it also has very weird sexual politics that Sudden Impact doesn't take seriously, but Tightrope at least attempts to try to... Uh, I mean, in attempts. Sex. When I saw Tightrope, I, uh, I was sort of thinking, what's the, what's the fuss about? I mean, Eastwood has made some great films. The Outlaw Josie Wales is a great film, but mm-hmm. I mean, uh, I mean, well, I guess he didn't direct Tightrope, but... but Tightrope made gestures in the direction of the idea that the cop could have these sort of twist, uh, sort of twisted psychosexual life that would make him equally as plausible to be the. I mean, the thing. I mean, I assume you, we're going to talk about Magnum Force. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, the the very same idea in Magnum Force, which is that sort of tease that you know, is Harry Callahan the one who's doing this? You know, is this guy? Is this some? Um, force unleashed from his id that's going around killing all these women I don't think it's really very satisfyingly worked out either in obviously in Magnum Force and not in Tightrope either but it showed you that Eastwood was maturing or at least he felt he should mature I don't know if he was maturing but he felt you know Richard Schickel thinks he was maturing but right. I, I, you know and, and bless Richard Schickel I love the guy but you know he's 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 one of these. He, he's a uh, an acolyte through and through. And um, in terms of Eastwood, God, you know, he's so brilliant. He's so much smarter with everybody else but Eastwood. Um, but when it comes to Eastwood, but you know, I, I mean, he Eastwood clearly, uh, you know, at a certain point was want, wanting to be taken much more seriously as a director, as an artist, and was beginning to introduce dissonances, introduce darker elements. He was flirting. I mean, it really wouldn't be until Unforgiven that he would he would really begin to flirt with the idea that you know maybe there was something wrong with with vigilantism and with pulling the trigger. And even then, I think I think Unforgiven is somewhat overrated as an anti vigilante. You movie. think it's Mystic River that goes to that point? If I'm not well, mistaken. Well, Mystic Mystic River does, but Mystic Mystic River, of course, is comes completely from the mind of Dennis Lehane. It's oh, not, of course. I, yeah, oh. but I wouldn't. Everybody's always saying, well, and in Mystic River, Eastwood did, you know, but the thing is that Eastwood just, you know, shot the script. Right, and, right. And based on the novel and didn't depart from it, but he was attracted to that. Yes, he was attracted to that material. Well, he well, wanted to make an, anti, an anti-vigilante an anti movie right. in a sense. Because well, you feel the third act of Unforgiven, it, it goes back to the Dirty Harry school. Yeah, how do you know that? How do you know that? How do I know that? Did I write that somewhere? You did write that. You wrote that in 2003 when you were ta- in the New York Times. Um, oh, my God. Yeah, dude, I, I follow you, baby. Yeah. David, <laughs> David, David wow. I'm your worst nightmare. We've been getting New York Magazine oh since the first, the first issue. And oh I've been keeping God. up with you ever since you've been writing for New York Magazine, but also you, all the stuff for Slate. But you are yeah. my worst nightmare because, you know, it's all self-contradictory, I'm sure. <laughs> I will David, send you... I am large. I, I can I have multitudes. I've myself in the last two weeks, okay? I will send you a picture of uh, of Jerry so that way you can recognize him. When okay, I'm... great. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, but, yeah, you know, I mean, Unforgiven, Unforgiven is a beautiful piece of work in a lot of ways, and it's a wonderful script, but... In the end, you know, it's not exactly like you're in mourning for anybody in the saloon that he wastes. I yeah, mean, I mean, it's not, these are like, you know, it's like, would you be in mourning for anyone in the Nuremberg trials? Of course not. You know no, what I mean? exactly, exactly. I mean, this is a, it, it, it's really not that much different from High Plains Drifter or from, you know, the, these other films that many of which sort of were inspired, that, that Leone did, inspired by Yojimbo, in which... You know, who cares who dies? I mean, they're all just, as Travis Bickle says, you know, flush him down the sewer That's or right. whatever he says. I mean, there's a, there's a sort of nihilistic component. It's not a, it doesn't, it's not a, a sort of law and order, strict law and order, you know, virtue triumph. It's a nihilistic component, but it's still very much a kind of a right wing, you know, disgust with, you know. Oh, of course. Uh, of course it is. That's, that's what makes Magnum Force. I like Magnum Force because, you know, you, like you said, is Callahan the one doing this? But he's like the lesser of the two evils. It's between that and Hal Holbrook's um, army, which has the guy from Animal House and David Soul in his army, which is, um, I don't know how if I want to really back that horse or not. So I'll go with yeah, Callahan. You know, you know, the thing is, they seem vaguely gay. That's another thing. Oh, well, that's, well, that's the mean, whole, there's a whole sub, you know, that movie yeah. is game, the whole uh, homophobic thing, because that's like... The, um, Callahan's uh, homophobia is represented in those men. 
Exactly. I mean, I, th- I sort of think that, that that was, that you know, that the subtext of that was that we, we should really leave law enforcement to the heterosexuals because the... Uh, because the, the the people who can't who are not in in control of their their um, their homosexual lusts are are, are really going to are, are they're the ones who are going to be the Nazis, be the stormtroopers, right. and then of course, as we all know, that climaxes in the Enforcer when he says, "You fucking fruit," as he like yeah, aims his bazooka right. at the tower in which the uh, <laughs> you know, and I, I I remember that. I remember in Richard Schickel's biography. I'm sorry, I hate to. Pick I have on it Richard right Schickel. here. I have the biography. I mean, he, I mean, he sort of, he sort of says, in retrospect, Eastwood thinks that perhaps if he had known that you know gays would be more respectable these days, he he would probably not have done that. I mean, <laughs> no, I don't think he would have. He says it's this much. hilarious. It's, this is he really says hilarious. Much in that, yeah. Yeah, I know. It's a. He, I mean, I mean, Schickel will contort himself all sorts of ways to. Uh, he, he does. Uh, can I say again? Every time I. Say Say something bad about Chickle. I have to say, I really like the guy's work, and he, we just have to. His blind spot, you know. Oh, he, he, his loathing of falling kale, and his, oh, he, you know, he idolatry, and his idolatry of of Eastwood. I think, I think we have to correct for those two things and say he's actually a pretty damn good critic. And you know, yeah. we, were, we all have, we, we all have those little. We mm-hmm. all have those little things that kind of blindside us. <laughs> right, exactly. I, I have that with Pacino. I, I can't tell when Pacino's overacting. I refuse to admit Pacino's not overacting there. No, no way. But oh so we all God. have those little I things. Would, you know what? If you if you had gone if you had gone to see Salome on Broadway, <laughs> the staged reading of Salome on Broadway, I, I I swear. I mean, Eastwood. I mean Eastwood. Pacino is. Um, you know, I, I I've given Pacino the benefit of the doubt a lot of times, but. There's something about seeing him live, seeing his shtick live, that makes you just throw up your hands and say, "He's just gone. Whatever, whatever he had, whatever he had is is long gone." You know, I, I just, D- D- David, man. Oh I, my I, God, baby! I, 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 I want you sorry. back on the show, but you just crossed the line. I'm sorry, sorry. I, I, I love you, man. I love you, man. We're, we're, we're not continuing this. Uh. Waiting. My, I loved him in um, I loved him in Waiting for Richard, and I you know I loved yes. him in the the thing with Sea of Love, but you know Pacino Pacino needs a director really badly. He does. Yes, 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 yes. Well, here's a here's a question. This is a question I, I did want to ask. On just on a dirt, we'll wrap, start wrapping this up on a dirty Harry tangent. Yeah. That, yeah. Uh, that you know Godard said that the only way to criticize a movie is to make another movie, and my question is. Is that uh, the Dirty Harry sequence in Zodiac? Do you think that could be seen as kind of the ultimate critique of Dirty Harry, the character, and the movie? In in David Fincher's Zodiac, right? In that the one sequence where, you know, they're they've been exhausted by this case. It's real. We, we've gotten to know this total grind of police work, and it's coming to nothing but dead end. And he's told to go take a breather. And he's obvious, and, and Mark Ruffalo uh, goes to the movies, and it's Dirty Harry, and he whispers yeah. uh, to his wife, "I gotta get out of here. They're making movies about it." And then the capper of the scene is he's outside smoking a cigarette, which is amazing enough uh, in a public place. And someone says, "Hey, Dirty Harry, did you work for you?" And Mark Ruffalo says the great line, "Yes." Yeah, so you know, as long as you know you forget due process, it would have been terrific. <laughs> yeah, it just seems yeah. like. And Fincher, like, uh, Fincher said, because he grew up in that era, he said, uh, actually in the commentary of Zodiac, he goes that he always felt a little uh, disturbed, even as a kid, when he saw Dirty Harry, in the way it kind of just blithely kind of took elements from the real tragedy and just really put them in a, in a pop form. Sure, but I, I mean, I mean, and that's a that's a really cool and funny aside, but you can't say that it's. It may be a critique of Dirty Harry, but which which had the greater power? Let me mm-hmm. ask you: which had the greater vis- which had the the profound cultural influence? It, it sure as hell wasn't David Fincher's Zodiac. No. Um, I mean, in the end, there, it's very very hard to discredit Dirty Harry mm-hmm. on on the level. First of all, it's a, it's a it's a fabulous piece of filmmaking. I mean, Don Siegel was really at at his peak there. You he know? was. He, it was so. I mean, it's so easy. His style was so easy, and it was so. I mean, if 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 there is any director who was kind of anti-lyrical in 
all the right ways. It was it was Don Siegel. That guy really knew what he was doing. I mean, he he really did have a have a kind of laid back jazz man's way of of. I mean, it's no wonder that Eastwood would want to emulate him. Well, um, it is it is interesting to note. You know, I don't if I remember correctly, Siegel was never nominated for an Oscar. But if you look at stuff like Body Snatchers and Dirty Harry and uh, the Alcatraz film, just those three, and his able to not do flourishes, but within right. the deficiency, there no are flourishes. flourishes. And yet, the, well, the the thing is that there's things that stick in your mind. Mm-hmm. There are things I remember. I've, I only saw the Alcatraz movie once when it came out, mm-hmm. and it is a superb movie, and it has so little action in it, and yet you're on the edge of your seat the entire time. I mean, it is it is Don Siegel stripped down to just the purest Don Siegel. Mm-hmm. And he just knows it's just a matter of construct, constructing a sequence. What mm-hmm. comes first? What comes second? When do you go for the wide shot? When do you go? It's just it's just he, he had a sort of storytelling instinct to right. just translate it into 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 the shots, into the order of the shots, into the, the you know, where the camera was placed. He was a wonderful, I mean, I, I'm not going to put him in my, well, I don't have a pantheon, but if I did, uh, I, I wouldn't put him in my pantheon, because I do love flourishes and interest. <laughs> right, right. Know? I'm a sucker for flourishes. But, you know, if I want to see, if I, it, I, I've been lately watching, you know, a lot more, I've been watching a lot more Don Siegel, Sam Fuller type movies, and and you know, and and Phil Carlson and people like that, and and trying to understand that that tradition because it, it's so antithetical to the all the film school graduates right. uh, nowadays who are so into showing you their flourishes. Uh, don't show me your flourishes. Put them back in your pants. Put your flourishes <laughs> back in your pants. God damn it! Just tell the story. <laughs> and, well, and, well, final. I, I guess the final question. We'll try to bring this to current events. Yeah. What do you think is? Has there been a film or any couple of films that have done what Dirty Harry has done? Maybe they haven't reached the zeitgeist that into the zeitgeist where Dirty Harry has, but have taken the, the archetype of this rogue vigilante cop and really taken it further, or maybe turned it on its head. From uh, the one film that I think of that no one probably remembers. There's a 1988 uh, thriller with James Woods called Cop. Oh uh, my God, Cop! I remember Cop. Yeah. Oh, really, Cop was Cop was a disgusting, very powerful, disgusting yeah. movie. I, I loved Cop. Well, I remember. Is, I remember the. <laughs> I remember the very end of Cop. Yeah. The last shot of Cop in the school gymnasium. We won't. Well, let's yeah. not spoil anything. But Cop was. Cop is a very you know, is a sort of Neanderthal piece of work, but it yes, definitely it is. is it definitely is along the lines of what you're talking about. It, it, no, it's actually like, it's almost like, like they said, Okay, let's take Dirty Harry and what if he's really, really dirty? And yes, that's it, right. And that's really, like, really dirty Elroy Harry. That's what they should have called it. Right. That's James Elroy for you. Right. And but, you know the thing here. Yeah. But what do you think? Is a, a, do you, I mean, is cop or what? I guess the modern one is Training Day. A lot of people throw that out there, but I, I don't. I don't really. You hold see, that you see, I think, I think actually that the new generation. It's very hard to do. Really, the Jodie Foster movie was was the purest vigilante movie I've seen, and there are people who think that's a masterpiece. I'm, I, I was sort uh, of not quite stunned by it, uh, by its crudeness. I, I, I mean, I really thought it was. It looked like a 25-year-old movie in terms of its sensibilities, but and, and in the New York that it depicted. But mm-hmm. although it was done from a feminist perspective, although M- Ms. 45 certainly, you know, had 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 you know had been over that territory before. But I think I mean I mean revenge will always be a component of of movies. I mean it was from the beginning. It will be, and and darn it's satisfying when it's done well. But the straight out you know anti sort of left wing the law is impotent vigilant vigilante movie i i don't really know i don't know if there's anything nowadays i mean training day the guy was a psycho mm-hmm. and um and i think that and even you know there was a fascinating line in Bat- batman begins was all about you know will 
Bruce Wayne become a vigilante or not? And mm. and Katie Holmes of all people said a wonderful line, which <laughs> didn't say it well, but it was a very very well written line about how you know um, justice is about harmony. Vigilantism may be may enforce a kind of justice, but it doesn't enforce a sort of larger harmony. And and uh, and Bruce took that to heart and decided that, you know, he was going to work within the law, uh, to, you know, to a certain extent. He was going to have allies within within law enforcement. So I, I think we've, we've moved beyond that. Um, we haven't moved beyond that on Fox TV, but we've, we have with Nancy Grace, but I, th- I think we, we have moved beyond that. But look, you know, um, it'll come back. The pendulum will swing back. <laughs> 